Hey Optimancers, Chris here. Do you know how mounted combat works in D&D? Are you sure? Do you share the same turn as your controlled mount? Do you and your controlled mount have to take your turns separately? What square do you occupy when you're mounted? Do you share your mount space? Do you occupy the middle of the spaces that the mount occupies? Do you provoke opportunity attacks if you're on a mount? Have you read and listened to everything Jeremy Crawford has had to say on the subject? What he's tweeted on the subject? Do you find his guidance contradictory? Are you still sure? Well, if you aren't, then you're in the right place. Today I'm going to go through mounted combat, how it works according to the rules and the input of the designers, and why the guidance they've given does not necessarily contradict itself, at least in the examples I've been presented. Whether your mount is controlled or not, or whether you can even control your mount, or what happens if that changes in the middle of a combat. Whether the rules are clear or not, what is clear is that mounts are cool and fun. The option of a mounted character is something that is good for increasing the options for characters to have distinctive and unique characteristics. And it also gives options for DMs to create a campaign that is more dynamic. So having some clear guidance on how the rules work I think is good for the game and that is what I intend to provide with this video. If you would like to support the content created on this channel or you're getting tired of the ads on this channel then I have a link to my Patreon in the video description. Patrons of this channel receive rewards like ad-free early releases of these videos and my top level patrons can join me for a D&D session each month. Today I would like to recognize these top level patrons whose support helped me produce the content on this channel. Geek Dice, Glenn Wilson, Jay Gemmel, James Sprague, James Thomas, John Matera, John Cripps, Jonathan Haynes, and Joseph Robido. Thank you all for your continued support. Let's get started. There are actually not many rules in the game for mounted combat. What we do have appears in the player's handbook, and these brief rules tell us that mounts provide speed and mobility, and they tell us what creatures can be used as mounts, how to mount and dismount, what happens if your mount suffers force movement or is knock prone, and makes a distinction between a mount that is controlled and one that isn't. What the rules do not tell us is how mounted combat works on a grid and a number of details on how certain interactions affect mounted combat. So let's go through them. For the topics I'll be covering, this video has been timestamped for easy reference for you. First, let's discuss what you can use for a mount in the first place. According to the rules, a mount must be at least one size larger than you. Be willing to be used as a mount and have the appropriate anatomy to serve as a mount. So in some cases, this is easy. A horse is large sized, is likely trained to be ridden, so is likely willing, and has a large, smooth, horizontal back that a medium sized creature could easily straddle. So in the case of real world examples, we're going to be able to fit these requirements. A small sized character could ride on a pony. Things like an elephant, a camel, a water buffalo, bull, ostrich, these animals should be capable of bearing a rider at least one size smaller. However, in D&D we have fantasy creatures, so what the DM needs to determine is whether the creature is going to be willing to carry a rider and whether it has the correct anatomy to do so. We're not given any guidance on what the correct anatomy entails, but I think we can infer that the correct anatomy means that there needs to be a place on the creature where a rider could reasonably sit or straddle without impeding the movement of a creature and could reasonably stay without falling off. Presumably the mount itself needs to be able to move without injury or undue effort for extended periods of time as well. Beyond that it's totally up to the DM. We certainly have some fantasy examples of ridden griffins, dragons, dinosaurs, and giant birds. We also have cases of some fantasy humanoids using creatures that we as humans don't normally use as mounts like deer, bears, and dogs. The DM is simply going to need to determine for themselves how flexible they wish to be with this requirement to fit the vision they have 
of their own fantasy world. According to Jeremy Crawford, the DM should go with their narrative gut, which I think is probably the best advice. As to whether a creature is willing, I think we can be a bit more distinctive. I would not say that every horse wants to be ridden, but the real question is whether the horse is going to actively resist being ridden. If it does, then it's not going to count as a willing creature, and therefore cannot be ridden. This is often going to come down to whether it's been trained to be ridden. So what happens if you try to mount a creature that is unwilling? Well, we certainly see this in rodeo all the time. I think our best bet here is to use the grappling rules. You attempt to mount a creature, it actively resists, make your grapple attempt. As long as the creature is attempting to remove the rider, we can make the escape checks for the creature. If the creature tires of trying to remove a would-be rider, or determines that it can't remove said rider, it may eventually resign itself to carrying the rider, in which case the mounting of the creature is eventually successful. To be clear, the rules don't explain how this scenario works. That is simply the method I would use to run it, and I would recommend it for DMs to take care of that situation. The size limit is a hard line, though. A pony or dog simply cannot be ridden by a medium-sized creature. If your character becomes large-sized, they're going to need a huge size mount. Something like a huge size giant would need a gargantuan mount. Next let's talk about the mounted combatant feet. The first thing I need to mention is that you do not need this feat in order to participate in mounted combat. But if you do have it, you get three advantages. The first is that you have advantage on melee attack rolls against any unmounted creature that is smaller than your mount. This gives a bigger incentive for a mounted combatant to have as big a mount as possible. The second is you can force an attack targeted at your mount to target you instead. And the third is that your mount essentially gets evasion if they're subject to an effect that allows it to make a dexterity saving throw for half damage. They only take half damage if they fail or no damage at all if they succeed. So does this mean that a character can have a horse and take mounted combatant and that horse won't die? No, it doesn't mean that at all. Mounted combatant will improve the durability of your horse, but it is unlikely to be able to survive effects that are likely to target you at higher levels, and it has no ways to deal with things like poison clouds or cones of cold or many traps. Really, I would say even if you consider this feat, you should have a replaceable mount. Maybe you have the Fine Steed spell, or a magic item that can create a mount, or you're using a Steel Defender, or something like that. A Warhorse out of the player's handbook will simply not survive higher levels of play, mounted combatant or no. So let's talk about mounting a creature. So to mount a creature, you must be within five feet of it. This would include being adjacent to the creature, or sharing its space. It costs half your speed to mount the creature, so if you don't have at least half your move available, you're not going to be able to mount. In addition, it is specified that if you have a speed of zero, you cannot mount the creature. This requirement does not change based on the mount, so mounting a horse or an elephant is going to use the exact same amount of movement. The same rules apply for dismounting, so unless you're falling off your mount, you will need to use half your speed to dismount, and you won't be able to do so if your movement is zero. The other restriction here is that you may mount or dismount once during your move. This means that if you mount a creature on your turn, you will not be able to dismount on that same turn, whether you have half your movement left or not. Now, as to what once during your move means, that's more vague. It might mean that mounting and dismounting may only be done on your turn as part of your move you take during your turn. Or perhaps it means that if you're granted movement when it's not your turn, like from a Glamour Bard's Mantle of Inspiration, for example, that could be used to mount or dismount as well. The reason this is vague is because officially a move is not part of an action. You get movement on your turn, but you may also get movement when it's not your turn. And the rules don't really draw a distinction between those two things, which makes me more inclined to think that whenever you move on any turn, you may mount or dismount a creature once by spending half your speed. Speaking of moving, I should note that if you are moved, 
rather than moving on your own. You do not provoke opportunity attacks, so if you ride past an enemy, you are not provoking. Your mount, however, can provoke as normal. And if your mount does provoke an attack of opportunity, the attacker can choose to attack either you or your mount. Of course, if your mount uses the disengage action and then takes its movement, then neither of you will be provoking attacks of opportunity. Now, how does this work on a grid? When you're a small-sized creature mounting a medium-sized creature, it's easy. Both creatures occupy one square, so we know exactly where the rider is in comparison to the mount. But what if you're a human mounting a horse? That horse takes up four squares, and you take up one. I've seen this handled multiple ways, and I've handled it multiple ways myself, including having the rider and the mount share one token, have the rider be in the middle, even if that means occupying an intersection between squares, or having the rider occupy one square of their choice on the back of the creature, or having a designated square on the back of the creature that is the rider's square. I can tell you that officially, the rules don't change when you mount a creature, which means that you occupy a square as normal, and that needs to be somewhere on the back of the creature. That means you could potentially move your token around the back of that creature. Tactically, this makes mounted combat really interesting, let me show you on a battle map. Okay, so when we mount our token, we have four potential squares we might take, and there is no rule for which of those squares you're going to use. So if we're just going to stick to the rules, it could be any of those squares. And this actually makes a mechanical difference, because let's say we have an enemy. Now if our horse was to move past that enemy, without taking the disengage action, it would provoke an opportunity attack. Now normally, the creature would be able to choose between attacking the mount or the rider. But in this case, the rider might actually be out of reach of the enemy, even though the mount is provoking the opportunity attack. The other thing this affects is reach weapons. So let's say our character is not using a reach weapon. Well, in this particular case, we would actually have to move on our mount to be able to attack this enemy. But the other way this could be useful to us is if we are on the opposite side of the mount and we have something like a lance, for example, that provides disadvantage to your attacks if you are adjacent to your enemy. By standing on the other side of your mount, we could actually use that lance without the disadvantage. Now, presumably, we can use our own movement to move around on the mount, or we could use the mount's movement to move us together. So let's talk about force movement and falling prone. As these situations are arising more now than ever, with all the new force movement options that present themselves in Tasha's, the rules specify what happens if either of these happen to your mount. If your mount suffers force movement, you need to make a dexterity DC 10 saving throw. If you succeed, you stay mounted, and you're presumably moved along with your mount. If you fail the saving throw, you fall off the mount and you fall prone in a space within five feet of it. Now the rules do not say whether you fall within five feet of the mount before or after its movement. In addition, the rules don't say if you choose the space you fall into. So in both cases, when the rules don't say it's your choice, it's not for the player to decide. The DM will determine where you fall prone. So as a DM, you're going to place the rider prone in the place that makes the most sense to you within five feet of the mount, either before, during, or after its force movement is completed. You may also choose to let the player choose, but that will be up to you. Now, if your mount is not prone, you will automatically be dismounted. If you have a reaction, you can use it to automatically land on your feet, presumably in the space you already occupied. If you don't use your reaction, or you don't have a reaction available, then you will fall prone within five feet of the mount, Again, this is going to be a space chosen by the DM. But what if the force movement or landing prone occurs to the rider? Well, in the case of being knocked prone, you treat it the same as if your mount suffered force movement. You make a DC 10 dexterity saving throw to stay mounted, and if you make the save, you're still riding, even though you're prone and you're going to need to use some of your movement to right yourself. If you suffer force movement, then the rules don't say. However, we can use other rules for guidance on what happens. 
Obviously, if you're moved off the creature, then you aren't riding it anymore. If that puts you in the air, then you're going to fall. If you fall 10 feet or more, you're going to take damage and fall prone. However, you might suffer force movement and still be within the area occupied by the creature. Remember that it's going to be a larger size than you. So if you're still on the creature, then presumably you're still mounted and only your space changes. Now in the case of a horse at least, a rider may have a saddle, reins they might be holding, stirrups in which their feet may be secured. The rules do not cover how these factors may affect force movement. So as a DM, you can make decisions that make sense. Maybe the rider has advantage on a save to resist force movement, or maybe if the rider is very secured, it might not be possible at all. If you are a player wanting to use force movement as a way to dismount your enemies, these things could be factors, so you need to check with your DM. Now, in my experience at least, I have never seen a player actually worry about using reins at all when they are mounted. But if they did, I think this could provide them some sort of mechanical advantage here. So when we mount a creature, we may control the mount, or we may let it act independently. Then it is considered an uncontrolled mount. Now, if a creature is intelligent, the choice of whether you control the mount or not may not be your choice at all. An intelligent creature, like a dragon, will want to make its own decisions, so it is likely to remain uncontrolled. In the case of a paladin's found steed, it may choose to allow itself to be controlled by the paladin, despite being an intelligent creature, which is a testament to the trust the paladin steed has in its rider. As a general rule, though, a creature that is intelligent will normally not be controlled, nor will any creature that hasn't been trained to accept a rider. Now, a creature that's not trained for combat may not be controllable in combat, while a creature trained to be ridden, including in combat, may or may not be controlled by the rider's choice. So first let's discuss uncontrolled mounts and how they work. So an uncontrolled mount is going to have its own initiative in combat and may make any movement or actions it desires as normal. As a DM you may want to let the player make those decisions though a horse not trained for combat may panic and run away or buck a rider. Some creatures may fly into a rage attacking allies or enemies without distinction. Other creatures may act tactically and effectively. As a DM, you determine that an uncontrolled mount may or may not act according to the wishes of the rider. And you may want to make those decisions yourself, or even assume control of a creature mid-combat. Things like being spooked by fire, fleeing once injury is received, or simply to refuse to put itself in a position of potentially dying might be perfectly reasonable. Whatever the mount does, the rider is along for the ride. The mount can do all of the things it would normally be capable of without a rider. It can attack, dodge, cast spells if it's able to do so, whatever. Since the rider's turn is separate, they will take their turn on a different initiative. This can make things difficult if that rider is using a melee weapon. If there are no enemies nearby on the rider's turn, they could find themselves unable to attack. Now, a player with an uncontrolled mount has a couple ways they might work around this. Uh, the first is they might ready an action so that on their mount's turn, they can then take an attack after the mount has moved. Or they might have the mount ready an action so that on the player's turn, the mount has ready to dash action so that it can move where it needs to. In either case, this creates some inconvenience. They are using up reactions. They may not be able to take their extra attacks. And so when we do this, it tends to reduce what these two creatures can do as a coordinated unit. In the case of the rider using a ranged weapon or ranged spells, then this tends to be less of a problem since positioning becomes far less critical. Now, if you're controlling your mount, then things change. The initiative of a control mount changes to match yours when you mount it. Changing initiative scores is almost unheard of in 5th edition, but this is an exception to that. Once a mount is controlled, then it can no longer choose its own movement or actions. Now the rider can have the mount use its movement as normal, and it can direct it to dash, disengage, or dodge. The mount is capable of no other actions, including attacking, well controlled. So what's the advantage of controlling a mount? Well, actually, it's really significant. 
According to the rules, a controlled mount can move and act on the turn you mount it. This means in addition to changing its initiative to match yours, it's actually taking its turn at the same time you are taking yours. This means you can mount and control a mount, it can move up to an enemy, then you could attack, and if that creature dies, maybe the mount takes a dash action, moving you to another target, or you make another attack. If you are a melee character, this can mean way more ability to move where you need to in order to make the attacks you want, especially if your mount is more maneuverable than you are. But what happens on the following round? This is the chief area of confusion I've seen. Normally, when you share your initiative with another creature, one of you takes your turn, completes your turn, then the other creature takes their turn and completes their turn. The rules specify on the turn you mount the creature, it can move and act on the turn you mounted it, but it doesn't say whether those overlapping turns carry into following rounds or not. Normally initiative orders don't change from round to round, but normally you don't take turns at the same time either. So we need to dive into what Jeremy Crawford has said on the topic. To begin with, in 2017 he was asked, A rider on a control mount wants to attack mid-move. Do the rider and the mount share one turn, or does the rider need to ready an attack? And Jeremy Crawford's answer is, A rider and a control mount have separate turns, but they have the same initiative, which means you decide which one goes first. So what this seems to say is that with a control mount, the rider decides whether the mount takes and completes its turn first, or whether the rider takes and completes their turn first, which would mean all this cool stuff we're just talking about doesn't work. However, then Jeremy Crawford did a Dragon Talk interview, where he spoke about mounted combat. In that interview, he said the following. Now, if you decide you're controlling the mount, different rules here, because suddenly the creature's initiative change, changes to your initiative. You're now acting as a unit. Mm -hmm. It still has a turn, but its turn basically overlaps with yours. It gets its move, and so the, part of the advantage of this is basically it's moving on your turn, so it's then far easier for your character to coordinate with the mount. Right. And the beauty of it acting on your turn to make it easy, you know, its turn overlapping with yours, is that then also your movement is still free to use on your own turn, and all your actions are still available. So the mount almost becomes a movement and action extension for the rider. Mm. Now he seems to be saying here that the rider and the mount are going at the same time, and can alternate moves and actions, and attacks, which allows for the cool stuff we were talking about. So which one is it? Well, then he was asked. Jeremy Crawford, I listened to your podcast Dragon Talk. Seems like you said that you and the control mount have the same turn. Does this mean that the rider and the mount share a single turn? But this tweet seems to contradict the podcast. Jeremy Crawford replied, A control mount has its own turn, but that turn takes place on the same initiative count as the rider's turn. So wait, did Jeremy Crawford just say that they take different turns, then turn around in an interview and say they take the same turn? And then turn around again and say afterwards, nope, they have different turns? Did he just contradict himself twice? This is the common perception. Jeremy Crawford said they must take separate turns, then he said they could share a turn, and then he changed his mind again. However, that's not necessarily true. When I look at the original tweet, the interview, and then the final tweet, there is a way that everything said could be consistent. So that's the way I think it should be taken. Though, admittedly, it could have been made much more clear by Crawford. I think he may have misunderstood some of these questions. So clearing that up is what I'm going to do right now. So did Jeremy Crawford actually say in that interview that the rider and the mount share their turns? Did he say that they take their turns at the same time? Let's watch again. Now, if you decide you're controlling the mount, different rules here because suddenly the creature's initiative change, changes to your initiative. You're now acting as a unit. Mm -hmm. It still has a turn, but its turn basically overlaps with yours. It gets its move 
And so part of the advantage of this is basically it's moving on your turn. So it's then far easier for your character to coordinate with the mount. Right. And the beauty of it acting on your turn to make it easy, you know, its turn overlapping with yours is that then also your movement is still free to use on your own turn and all your actions are still available. So the mount almost becomes a movement and action extension for the writer. Mm. Now I've watched this whole interview multiple times looking for a place where Jeremy Crawford says that the mount and the writer share a turn. But he is very careful about specifying that they indeed both have their own turns. He even corrects himself once when he almost says they share a turn to specify no separate turns. He also never says that their turns take place simultaneously. He says they overlap. So if we consider two turns that overlap, then those creatures could indeed coordinate and alternate between movements and actions. But also, there's still two distinct turns, and at least in theory, one of those turns starts first. So if that is the intent, is what Jeremy Crawford said on the subject consistent? A rider and a controlled mount have separate turns, but they have the same initiative, which means you decide which one goes first. If their turns, in fact, overlap, this is consistent. It still has a turn, but its turn basically overlaps with yours. Again, if their turns overlap, then yes, this is consistent too, and not contradictory to the initial tweet. Now this final tweet says, I listened to your podcast Dragon Talk. It seems you said that you and the control mount have the same turn. No, it didn't. He very distinctly said they have separate turns. Does this mean the rider and the mount share a single turn? The answer to that is clearly no. A control mount has its own turn, but that turn takes place on the same initiative count as the rider's turn. And in that context, not only is this tweet consistent, we see that the question Crawford is answering is whether the rider and the mount have only one turn, which he's been very consistent in saying is not the case. So are his replies consistent? Yes. Were they clearly explained? Obviously not, or I wouldn't be doing this video. Now are the things he's saying consistent with the rules as they are written? Actually, if we follow the rules as they are written, this is the only way it can work. So I am absolutely certain this is the way that mounted combat works according to the rules. Not just rules as intended, but rules as written. As I mentioned, other than mounting a controlled mount, initiative order does not change. This is a general rule within the game. Specifically, we can change the initiative once when we mount a creature because it is a specific rule that overrides a general rule. So if we control a mount and the rules say that we change the mount's initiative to match ours and that the control mount can move and act even on the turn we mounted it, then that has to be the case on the following round. Or we would need to change that order. And according to the rules, we can't change that order. So the mount would need to continue to overlap its turns with ours on the following turns unless the rules said specifically that we need to change it again on the following turn, which it does not say. Now your DM can override those rules, but the rules is written, that is the way it has to work. So that's it. Can a controlled mount move? Then we cast a spell, then the controlled mount move again, take an action, then we take a bonus action? Yes. By the rules as written, we can, and according to the designer, we can. And there's never been a rule written or a tweet written that counters that, to my knowledge at least. Now that doesn't mean Jeremy Crawford won't come around tomorrow and tweet something entirely different. But up to now, his position on this has been consistent. So now we know the rules of mounted combat. So let's talk about a fun way this might be used to our advantage. DMs out there, take note of this when you decide what creatures might be controllable or not. So we have an allied creature that can serve as a mount. So this is a Niosphinx. Looks a bit like a griffin and the DM says it can be used as a mount. The DM says it trusts the party to the point where the party can use it as a controlled mount. Well, isn't this interesting? So we roll initiative and the Niosphinx goes first. After the Niosphinx casts a spell, let's say uh, dispel magic, 
Then it uses its legendary actions on following turns to do some claw attacks. It also uses its reaction to make an opportunity attack. Then on the ranger's turn, it mounts and controls the Niosphinx. The Niosphinx initiative changes to the rangers and it gets another turn. At this point, our Swarm Keeper Ranger uses its gathered swarm to move itself five feet off the Niosphinx. Now the Niosphinx is no longer controlled, but it's still that Niosphinx's turn. So it could cast another spell or take another action. It also just got all its legendary actions back. It also got its reaction back. So it's completely possible that the Niosphinx might take two actions, two reactions, and six legendary actions before an enemy gets their first turn in combat. Now if that Nihilus Sphinx is controllable by another PC, this might even happen again, on the same turn, maybe more than once. Theoretically, a single creature could get many turns on the same round of combat. So this character mounts, Nihilus Sphinx gets another turn. If this character has a way of getting itself back off the Nihilus Sphinx, again, its actions won't be limited. Then this character mounts, same thing again. This could all happen in one round of combat, the Nihilus Sphinx getting a turn, over and over and over again. So yeah, I just thought I would throw that out there for Optomancers to chew on and for DMs to take heed. For now though, it's time for me to ride into the sunset, folks. So until next time, I'm going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks everyone. Talk to you soon.